You know, honestly, I'm mainly just sticking with this series for the Ben Mendelsohn, Samuel L. Jackson scenes at this point because they are fantastic. Like, legit, this has the potential to be the best bromance in the MCU, and I am I, that, that's saying something because there are a lot of bromances in the MCU. Hello, interwebs, and welcome to my review of the second episode of Marvel's Secret Invasion, this time episode two, Promises. And before we get started, uh, apologies for the, like, serial killer murder background that I have going on here. Like, wait, literally, I do not know why the William Shatner Michael Myers mask is the one thing that I have out. Just don't read into it. Just don't look into it at all. <laughs> but anyways, as I mentioned last week, I have been moving uh, the past few days. So my body is very, very sore from moving boxes and my brain is dead from having to deal with all the logistics of the move. Uh, so you might get a little bit of a manic Jesse for uh, for this video, but that'll part, part of be part of the fun. So so just to stick with me and the slightly lo-fi look for this review um, as I as I transition into a new phase of my life. But I'm trans, so we're good with transitions. Speaking of transitions, though, let's talk about this episode of Secret Invasion. On the whole, what I will say is I enjoyed this episode uh, a little bit more than I did the premiere, mostly because this episode slowed things down a little bit and gave us a few really excellent scenes with Samuel L. Jackson getting to to do something that he's never really been able to do much of with Nick Fury, and that is just like really embody the emotionality of the character. While Nick Fury has always been fun in the Avengers movies and all his other cameos, I don't think he's really gotten a ton of big, meaty, emotional character scenes outside of maybe, arguably, Winter Soldier. Uh, and this is the first time we're getting a lot of that and getting sort of him to take center stage. I mean, that's sort of the, the pitch of Secret Invasion, that it is the Nick Fury show. And on that level, I am really, really loving a lot of what this episode was doing with him. I think, first and foremost, the scene with him and uh, Ben Mendelsohn uh, in the train car, sort of escaping the scene at the uh, end of last episode, uh, was a particular highlight of this one. I really liked uh, Nick Fury sort of starting to showcase some of his backstory and relating it to the present day and also relating it to his um, experiences as a black man and how that relates to his uh, understanding of what the Skrulls are going through and yet also um, how it also makes him distrustful and suspicious of the very idea of, you know, you know, humans and Skrulls being able to get along. Um, I, I thought that that was a, a really, really, uh, really like like nuanced scene that I really, really enjoyed in isolation and how he kind of like turned that around on Ben Middleson's character, uh, uh, Talos, I'm blanking on his name for a second, uh, and, uh, and, and sort of like used it to interrogate him a little bit, but also that scene showcasing the connection that those two still have. Like I love Talos just sort of like laughing a little bit and, and sort of in, and getting enthralled in um, Nick Fury's story about his family. So just the push and pull between those two men, I think is, is one of the strengths of this series and one of the, the the main strengths of this show uh, so far. Uh, and that scene is also sort of uh, reiterated later on when we have the Rhodey and Nick Fury scene, where we have these two uh, men relating to each other as black men uh, and talking about their history and their relationship to power dynamics and systems dynamics that, that might have, you know, pushed them to uh, the side as black men having grown up in America. Um, and how that might also relate to the Skrulls situation as well. Um, and I it occurs to me, too, that this might be the first time that Rhodey and Nick Fury have had a scene together, despite the fact that they uh, have both been characters in the MCU right from the very beginning in the first Iron Man movie, and Don Cheadle having taken over the role in Iron Man 2 and both of those characters being fairly prominent in that movie. But this is the first time I think they've had a scene together, at least any scene of note, where they get to interact with each other. Um, and it was really, really well done, I think. Uh, and frankly, I, I think they should have had more of these two together because I think they bounce off of each other in really intriguing ways uh, as showcased there. However, this then brings me to uh, more of my hesitations with this series as a whole. Uh, as many of you know, if you watched my review of the premiere episode of this show, I have been very concerned with the uh, politics of this series, given that we do have the Skrulls cast as refugees, um, and then you also have the leader of the Skrulls uh, being played by a man of color. Uh, and what that sort of says that, you know, we have these refugees who want to, uh, you know, genocide all of humanity and frankly I don't think this episode does much to assuage those fears there are a couple hand wavy things like one-off lines that I think are meant to sort of like 
denote that there is some sort of uh, awareness on the show of the problematic nature of this storyline. Like, for example, one of the scrolls in the meeting uh, with the uh, the terrorist guy, I mean, I'm even blanking on his name so far, but the villain character, they have that meeting where they, he sort of like takes over and becomes the leader of the scroll splinter groups. Um, there's one sort of says like, well, we were too willing to wage war. That's what got us into this mess. And I think the implication is, and we kind of get this hinted at in the Ben Mendelsohn scene earlier with, um, with, uh, Samuel Jackson's with Nick Fury, um, where we get this hint that the Skrulls may have been the one that instigated the war with the Kree in the first place, which then is why they sort of like lost their homeland to the Kree. And ah, I think that's meant to sort of like like give more agency to the Skrulls in this situation, but I think that just honestly makes the implication a hell of a lot worse because then it's sort of saying like well maybe they are inherently aggressive or even beyond that like they are are uh kind of like trying to make it so like like they deserve the fact that they're being hunted down and i know that's not a statement on the show saying like every scroll is like this but it is sort of a way that the show is trying to get at like oh maybe it's okay that we villainize this specific group of scrolls and we don't get a ton of analysis of their grievances i'm hoping that the show will go into greater depth uh with the bad guys uh like opinions and and thoughts in a way that isn't just wholly villainizing because we get a little hints of it in the opening uh flashback sequence at the start of the episode where we meet this character as a kid and we get the implication that nick fury despite his reservations used this kid as like a child soldier which is incredibly fucked up and if so would uh be one thing that would honestly make you know the bad guy somewhat more um sympathetic in a way but i don't know if the show is going to go full on and sort of like really implicate nick fury as like yo this was messed up and you you did a really horrible thing here and i feel like the show is going to go the same route as captain um falcon captain america and the winter soldier um i want to say captain falcon falcon punch and the winter soldier um and uh and just villainize the bad guys even though they have understandable grievances and just have them be evil and do horrible violent acts despite you know them having uh actual reasonable things to be concerned about like them being used as child soldiers um so all of all of that just really just deeply deeply concerns me and this is compounded a little bit by the fact that we have um this uh woman who takes over for nick fury and starts torturing this scroll guy and it kind of is leading down the exact path that i was worried that they were going to do with her character uh at the beginning uh of last episode when we first met her which is i think they're going to showcase that she's like the bad version of a sh person in charge of shield she goes too far and that's sort of justifying the scrolls anger but then sort of going like well if we remove the bad apple then we can have nick fury uh, to come in and he's one of the good ones and it still doesn't uh, un get rid of the underlying systemic problems that were inherent in S.H.I.E.L.D. and the choices that Nick Fury himself also as an individual made uh, towards the Skrulls and so I feel like this is the show sort of like trying to like push it all off on her and sort of setting her up as like just she's the really fucked up person but we can have a good person in the system and not sort of underlying the problems of systemic injustices against refugees so all of this stuff is sort of continually to compound for me about like I'm really worried about the way that this show is framing its antagonist and the discussion of refugees which is uh, i think very critical especially right now given our political context surrounding the vilification of refugees in the united states specifically um even though this show it is a united states uh made show even though the show kind of goes out around the world and it's, it's a globe charting series it is very very much i think steeped in american politics in terms of how it's being presented and, and thought about by the writers um so all of that stuff like really concerns me and and I'm deeply, um, uh, I'm still keeping my eye on it. I'm hoping maybe they can turn around and pull a reverse, you know, uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier here, um, but uh, and, and sort of end in a more positive place. Um, but I, I'm not really seeing the seeds of that being placed here too much, and so that's why I'm ultimately still kind of concerned. Um, I think that's pretty much everything that I had thought about this episode. Oh, we also got to meet uh, Maria Hill's mother, um, and this sort of like underscored the fridging element 
element of Maria Hill's character last uh, last week. Um, something I didn't touch upon because I was in the moving phase was I, I was bothered by Maria Hill's death in the sense that she was fridged, which is a woman, which is a character often a woman character, but not always a woman character who is killed off to uh, motivate the central protagonist, often in a male character, and that's certainly what's happening here with Maria Hill. And we get that even underscored with the scene with her mother, where um, Samuel L. Jackson literally says, like, she died doing something for me. Uh, this guy killed her to get to me, and it's like, oh, so she wasn't even killed for her own terms. She wasn't even killed for her own, you know, the fact that she was a shield agent. She was just killed to mess with Nick Fury, um, which sort of, I think, really does the character and Kobe Smulders as an actor uh, a huge disservice um, and disappointing to fridge that character in that way. Um, so yeah, so that that ultimately that scene was disappointing. Anyways, that's uh, sort of most of my thoughts on this episode. Um, like I said, sorry if I missed a couple things. I'm in the process of moving some unusual like note taking and stuff is sort of push to the side here. Um, one other thing I did want to mention, there has been some controversy about the uh, AI opening credits. I mentioned that in my review last week, but I sort of did the review so uh, soon after the episode up, uh, went up, I didn't have all the information. It has been revealed that uh, that it was made with AI, the opening credit sequence, but that the opening credit sequence was done in conjunction with, um, a, uh, with artists who chose to go the AI route. And my opinion on this is one, there is an argument that I certainly say that can be made about artists choosing to use AI to sort of underscore the message that they want to have for the series. And I certainly think that that works in this particular case that there is something to be said about like this disgusting, gross, kind of off-putting, uncanny valley art made by, you know, a non-human entity, um, you know, AI specifically, uh, kind of fits this sort of vibe for secret invasion. And so I think on that level, uh, it, it you know, there's an artistic argument to be made that I think, you know, using AI in this way is a tool. And I think AI should be a tool. It shouldn't just be wholly vilified. It is a tool that we can use to do certain things. Um, and as long as, you know, the tool isn't being used to, you know, shove out paying human beings, pay artists, you know, not being used by a corporation to sort of say like, oh, we don't want to pay, you know, certain people. We just want, we'll use AI to just sort of make it cheaper. Um, if that's not the impetus, I, I can get behind that to a degree. But that being said, I still think it is in poor taste given the ongoing discussion right now, uh, specifically around the WGA writer strike, but I think just generally uh, around our culture about how big corporations like Disney are using AI to uh, to do exactly what I just said, to shove out artists, shove out human beings, to try and make things cheaper, to make an extra buck, and removing the humanity, the artistry behind these things. Um, and so while this specific case, I think it, there's an argument that can be made for the artistry of it, I think given the context that we are in right now, specifically around the WGA strike and writers fighting to be uh, not to be replaced by AI and that being a main sticking point of that. I think it is in bad taste uh, at the very least to do this right now, to do to do this sort of thing. I think they should have read the room better. And also too, what also more concerns me is this might be used as a precedent for further down the line, other companies pointing to Secret Invasion saying, well, they did it and they had artistic intention. And so maybe another company will sort of like argue that in a less clear cut way uh, to be able to push out even more artists and say, well, hey, look, they set the precedent. Um, um, so there's there's that element. Uh, that's a little bit of the slippery slope concern, so I won't push on that one too hard. I think the bigger concern is like reading the room right now when it comes to AI and this sort of being a kind of a bad look. Um, but uh, but I think there's also something to be said about the, the precedent setting there as well. Um, but I think, uh, you know, like I said, I, I it's not the worst use of it by any means, and I'm glad that an artist was paid uh, to make this opening credit sequence, um, that there was intent behind it, um, but it still, still leaves us like Slight bad taste in my mouth, especially given the larger political context of the series that are also leaving a bad taste in my mouth so far. So yeah, um, like basically to wrap out, I I am liking the character interactions with Nick Fury. I'm liking the sort of like stuff it does on an individual level uh, throughout the series so far, but on a larger sort of macro level. Um, I just, this series is, is kind of like, uh, just rubbing me the wrong way. That's it. Let's say at this point, and I'm willing to give it the grace of the next four episodes to see where it goes with it. Um, but, uh, but at this point I'm, I'm not particularly enthused. So that's my thoughts on this episode of Secret Invasion. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. I'm going to go finish unpacking and, uh, hide my murder masks. And, uh, I hope you're all taking care of yourselves. Live long and prosper.